But Rohit, maybe a quick word on, yeah, um, on how that works I mean, from, a, I mean, from an economic as well as from a, right. uh, a viability perspective. I, 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 I think, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Sain said, most of the places that where we operate are already electrified. Uh, the model that we see emerging is that of coexistence. Uh, mini grids are becoming the solution of the last mile and they will, with the help of the policy, eventually dovetail into the main infrastructure. Uh, but these are uh, grids which actually go and cover the last mile uh, in greater details. Uh, they also become a solution to give you electricity at any time that you need. Uh, he was emphasizing on peak hours that we do in any case, but we even give flexibility for you to take power at any other time that you want during the day. Uh, so I think the USP will continue to be availability of reliable power. Just to give you a parallel example, in a city like Gurkha, there is six to seven hours of non-availability of power today. And every housing society in Gurga has a backup generator where people are paying 17 to 18 rupees a unit uh, for the DG backed up power and they pay 6 to 7 rupees a unit uh, for the grid power. So, I mean, our cities are very happily implementing the model. Here we are talking of the backup power coming from renewable sources uh, at a competitive price, uh, at a price package which is actually cheaper than kerosene and, and, and candles. For instance, the big, basic most package that we offer in the village is 110 rupees a month. You cannot even burn candles for that. And it goes all the way up to metered connections. So I think just to clear the other doubt, that it's not that you only can get packages from the mini grid. It depends on whether your mini grid is utility scale or not. And if it is utility scale, you could get even metered connections from it. So I'm going to um, thank our panel here for really helping elaborate on the complexities of how this sector is moving forward from the policy side, the technology side, the entrepreneur side, from the enterprise production side. I hope that gave people a sense of how we need to be moving things to forward in a coordinated way and really um, that has been very much the focus of our approach. Um, so let's give them a, a round of applause before I invite uh, our next panel. We're going to transition uh, very quickly to invite uh, uh, three other colleagues onto the stage now. This is going to be a, a focus on now on looking at the investment side. We've talked a bit about the risks in the model. So what is it that investors are asking? What are they seeking? And how do we see this business model evolving through that lens? Over to you, Greg. Thanks. My name is, is Greg Beach. And, um, I am uh, the director of Kenny Art. We finance uh, commercial and industrial solar in the US and rural energy access projects in Africa. We're, we're new to India, and so I was asked to play the uh, cynical, perhaps skeptical role of investor on this panel uh, to ask some hard questions, hopefully, about whether this model is financeable. Um, so that's what I want to get into with, um, with, with this panel in the, in the short time that we, that we have. I guess as an investor, um, I think about two parts to this equation. The first part to this equation is figuring out whether there are financeable cash flows. So uh, I heard some things from the previous panel that I liked, things like flexible tariffs. Um, I heard some things that I didn't like, things like uh, my investment could go away and be bought out at perhaps a, a lower return profile than I had initially gone into it. So, um, so I'm, I'm intrigued to get into some of these issues with um, with the panel. So um, I first want to talk a little bit about cash flows. Um, Rohit did a really good job of laying that, laying out that ABC model um, and giving, giving me a sense of where that customer demand is. But how do I get a sense of whether that's contract demand, right? H how long can I expect that demand to last? And um, you know, how can I, how do I think about that going forward? So, uh, in, the, in the model, you, when you look at the uh, anchor load, I think one of the, the vital role that an anchor load plays is that the mini grid operator, in the first thing they are looking at is how can I get at the unit level cash flow that it pays for the 
manpower and operational cost at the unit level. And what an anchor tenant like a telecom tower does is uh, it takes care of that first part, which is very important for the mini grid operator, because the uh, micro enterprise loads and the community loads have a ramp up curve, and you take time to develop and acquire a customer, you know, door to door, one by one, and that so that's very important uh, role that an anchor tenant plays. So, um, if I hear you correct, without any, without the B and C, if I just had the A uh, on any of these projects, I could finance them purely as a as an anchor tenant load, just to provide power to that telecom tower, and I'd recruit my investment. No, I, I, what I meant was that you can do unit level cash break even. It's not a P&L uh, level break even. You have to develop the community loads to uh, make a return on your investment. And uh, what, what duration contracts are some of those anchor tenants willing to, to sign up for? Those long term commitments? Yeah, the uh, typical practice in the uh, with the telecom anchor loads at least is about five to ten years of uh, uh, contract with uh, uh, specified and a mechanism for adjusting tariff depending on diesel and other elements. And uh, of course, they come with uh, stringent service level uh, requirements. But uh, you can also seek a minimum guarantee in terms of consumption uh, that uh, you know the telecom tower assures to buy from the mini grid. Yeah, that, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, Giant, I know you're um, beginning to look at financing some of some of these projects. Uh, I guess first, I'm interested in what the financing uh, value chain looks like. So, in project finance in other markets, um, projects like this tend to have you know, different financing mechanisms along the project life cycle. So there might be a development, you know, financer early on, there might be a construction lender, and then there might be an operator that, that, that buys that project and operates that project and makes returns. So I'm curious what you see in that financing value chain right right now as, as it relates to many years. Sure. Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, could you color how uh, project finance uh, behaves in other markets? Uh, in the Indian market, project finance uh, tends to be a little flatter when you're looking at banks or development organizations. Uh, when they're looking at projects, they're looking at, uh, uh, and, and especially for Minigrid, which is an infrastructure profile project, uh, they look at a uh, high degree of certainty in terms of the project execution and operation. And uh, that's something which helps. Uh, second, uh, you have an issue of uh, the kind of uh, uh, returns uh, which are there with the Minigrid projects today. Uh, if you if you just delve into the nature, and we heard a lot from other earlier speakers on that, uh, you're looking at Minigrids having relatively high capex compared to the revenue flow, which means payback is long. You're looking at uh, Minigrids, uh, the revenue ramp up uh, spreading across two or three segments where people have to sell the, the production every day to a doorstep every day. So you have some long-term contracts, you have some day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month sales which are happening. So the volatility revenue through the year can be significant. So that's the second issue, right? And third is you're looking at event risk. So except UP, and we heard about uh, what progress they have made, but except UP, no other state has really given an answer on what happens to me uh, as an operator or as a financier in case grid comes in. At that point of time, are we looking at a coherent approach? Are we looking at situations where the customers go away and then I need an exit, right? So uh, looping this back to the banking project finance market, at this stage, uh, the industry is, a, is relatively nascent for it to attract significant amount of interest from the mainstream financiers. Uh, so what is needed then? What is needed is you need to have a certain amount of units go live. You need to build the evidence that you know these are the revenue build up capacities, these are the execution capacities, this is the policy certainty of how the policy play out happens. Uh, so you need at this stage uh, what I mean uh, you call the early stage funders for the overseas market, you need somebody who is able to do a market making approach, take a market making approach to this segment. 
uh, take risk with the early adopters. Uh, oh, sorry, the um, early uh, projects where the risk is uh, uh, is is manageable, and at the same time work with the mainstream to say that look, uh, these many projects are now operational. Do you want to come in now as a co-investor or, or, or whatever? Uh, so that is an approach we should take the industry from uh, 80 odd uh, plants which we talked about to maybe 500 or maybe 1000 plants at which stage you would have uh, hopefully improved uh, capex profile, improved, improved revenue consistency, uh, proven uh, IRRs for the mainstream to start coming in saying that they are interested. The interesting thing, though, about what you just said is that as that project is de-risked and as it gets closer to something that a mainstream institution might fund, uh, is the risk of the grid coming and then actually buying that project to help not increase it at the same time. So while you might see, okay, the economics now make sense, it may be closer to that exit event that might um, that might then dis displace that. that. That's sort of just an interesting kind of Paradox. So, right. That, I mean, uh, the, the right word is the paradox. Uh, but but we have to look at the fact that in UB, we just heard uh, grid coexists everywhere. You have, uh, as, as Mr. Sancharma had said, you need a policy consistency, uh, or not just a policy consistency. You need a policy to be laid out and implemented consistently. And you need to see how customers react to this issue of I don't have power in the peak time versus I do have power in the peak time. I am ready to pay this much versus I am ready to pay that much. So there is some evidence which is needed uh, along with the policy uh, implementation for that to, that to make sense to uh, financiers and investors. Um, does the audience have any questions about um, about financing these grids? I want to make sure. We, we were very limited in time here. I want to end on time. Um, so just, just one more comment uh, I mean, before, before we go to the audience. So uh, what, what was, uh, when I said you need a market making uh, approach, uh, at that stage you also have to realize that some of the money which is going to go into this segment is going to come in from uh, mixed motive, not, not necessarily the mainstream. And when that money is going in, uh, that has to be used intelligently to create the evidence for the mainstream to come. So uh, in, in Seekers, what we are trying to do is we are trying to create that platform where we create evidence of one side and are able to give a vehicle for mixed motive um, investments to flow through this as well as other such um, sub-segments which are not currently being addressed by the industry. Yeah, and actually it does, it does raise the question of where that capital is going to come from. Do you, do you think um, most of that capital is going to come domestically or um, do you think foreign investment has a role to play uh, in financing? So, uh, uh, I mean, the mixed motive traditionally in India has come in from uh, foreign sources. At this stage, most of Indian uh, uh, capital, which is mission oriented, is going in as grants. Uh, I do hope that at some point in time there is a mixed motive uh, investment market which develops in India. Uh, we are looking to raise uh, risk capital both in India and abroad, as well as mixed motive capital from abroad. Jenny, you have a few thoughts on bringing capital, what Smart um, is doing in terms of building that ecosystem. Yeah, so, uh, you know, while uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has a dedicated line of uh, like financing, but bringing capital into India is an arduous uh, task. So, our effort has been to, you know, uh, have an entity in India which can quickly uh, consummate uh, deals. And uh, I think that's where uh, Seekers uh, comes in as an Indian NBFC, which is, uh, which has one created and dedicated for the smart power uh, model mini grids and therefore I think uh, this combination can accelerate the development process. Um, there are questions from uh, from the audience for, for folks. Yep, see one in the back right there. Uh, yesterday we were at, uh, from Angelica and yesterday we were driving a session on off-grid financing in India. And uh, you know we had several enterprises there and the kind of need that was coming out uh, was that there is, especially for the enterprises that are scaling up, they're looking for some kind of rent financing which seems to be a primary aspect. And towards that uh, we were hearing from the FIs, especially the banks that 
you need, clear, fundamentally right? need to move away from collateral based models to cash flow based models, which, which is not really going to happen. With respect to NBFCs, there is a high cost of capital associated with NBFCs. In all this respect, uh, we were thinking probably there is a need for some alternative financing structures to kick in, uh, which could probably combine soft capital and commercial capital. Uh, and uh, you know, innovate on what structures are you know possible in this scenario. So, uh, I like to request some views on this. So, what kind of alternative mechanisms do you think can be uh, uh, planned for the off-grid sector in general? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I wanted to to John because I, I think as he was speaking, I, I was thinking similarly that with the revenue volatility, it's, it's not the best sort of cash profile for a traditional debt investor. So. Yeah, thinking about mechanisms, giant thoughts on them. Uh, except for saying that MUC is, I mean, in your question, you said all this needs to be done. Makes take an uh, take an entity, makes soft capital and commercial capital uh, use a cash flow based approach, which is not collateral based, right? The only part I didn't get is why did you say an MBFC can't do it? Because we are setting up as an MBFC and we propose to do uh, so exactly this. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was pulling a yeah, leg. I, I just uh, you know, want to make a small point here. So NBFC is certainly you know, wanting to do it and uh, you know, the problem lies in the cost of capital that fundamentally NBFC right. has, so which is much let higher. Me address, so let me address that as well. Right. Uh, before this, I used to head microfinance for a private, large private bank. And uh, in microfinance, the uh, social uh, lenders had the comfort of lending to the MFIs at 15% and have the MFIs lend it out to the uh, to the end borrowers at 25%. That luxury is not there in most other segments, right? Uh, so when you look at the NBFC cost of capital, you have a few NBFCs which are large branded, which have very, very low cost of capital comparable to mainstream uh, uh, lenders. Uh, what we are saying is we will need to uh, leverage uh, the, mark the mixed motive fund availability in the market, blend it with Main Street to get our cost of capital down to a level where it becomes relevant to people like OMC. Uh, because if I go and tell OMC that, hey, I am a MBFC and I, my cost of capital itself is 15%, there is no, there's no dice. I mean, the, the project IRS will support that. So we need uh, to, we, we are, no, sorry, we are creating an institution which will target lowering our cost of capital with the objective of lending to many grids and similar segments uh, at rates which are meaningful. Uh, that's, that's something we should do. We have time for one more question, if there is one. And uh, check back out when you close. So, let me just uh, thank very much, uh, Jaydeep and Jen, especially Greg, for, for moderating this short discussion on, on the investment climate. So give them, please, a hand.